Today, I thought I'd answer the top 10 burning questions you have about RV life. I'll give you my perspective. I'm not the uh, authority, but I have an opinion. And I'm gonna give it to you. One popular question that's come up quite a few times is what inspired us, what inspired our family to do RV life? You know, we had a lot of rough times where we were just in survival mode, just getting by, just barely being able to pay the bills, rent a house, and then we bought a house and that was great. We were so excited and we loved that. You guys, what is it? I don't know what this is. You don't know what that is? No. What does it look like? What? A key? <laughs> to what? You bought this house? We bought it and closed, closed it. <laughs> this is our new house. How cool Hi, is that? You know what these are? Our new house? Keys to a different house. Yeah, we got it? We bought Walnut. Seriously? We're moving there? Tonight, we're staying there. No, we're not. Yeah. Seriously? For the last month, I've been working on that deal. <laughs> We've closed on it today. The house is in our name. Where's your vet? Where's mom's car? Oh, they're not here. Where's... What? Where are they at? What do you look so weirded out about? Do you buy a house? See what that is? Go inside and get the milk and a sponge. Why? Because we're going to bring it over to the other house. Why? Because we're not sleeping here no more. I'm serious. Go get it. Milk and sponge. Yeah. We don't got a real beautiful house, but we got a new house. We thought our problems were solved. But in the reality of it, you know, even though your rent, your mortgage payment's stable, the insurance payments in California were just going crazy, fire insurance and stuff. So anyways, long story short, we got right back to that same spot. Even though we started making a lot more money, we were still in survival mode still just barely get by it was like there was no escaping that no matter if we rented no matter if we bought a house no matter if we made a little bit of money no matter if we made a lot of money it was always survival mode go to work come home pay bills you know make money to buy a car so you can go to work come home pay more we just bills. never got out of we weren't living any kind of a life we sat there when we got home we watched tv and we seen people living their lives. We never got to experience it. It just got old. The kids, the boys, they started hanging out with wingnut friends, getting into trouble. Uh, Maddie, she just kind of retreated to her bedroom. It was during COVID, never really left much. Couldn't, you know, you know how that stuff went. So in the real estate market in my area, I was a realtor. Did a big pop and all of a sudden we were up 30, 40%. Or, you know, over $100,000 on what our house is worth compared to what we paid just two years earlier. I said, it's time. Let's make that change. Let's sell the house. Let's sell everything. I know everybody's always like, well, don't sell your home base. Blah, blah, keep it. But there was just, you know, too much risk in keeping the home. Fire insurance is in California. We were, we were paying eight hundred dollars a year. Now some of the neighbors back in the neighborhood are paying six to 8000 a year. It would have been the same old thing. Go to work, pay your bill, and that's it. So anyways... We decided to sell the house, make this huge change. Jen would be a travel nurse. I would do some work that I was able to do from home on the road. I still look back, like how did we make that decision? Cause we're not huge risk takers, but we made that decision somehow. It all happened and uh, it was some of the worst days and some of the best days at the beginning, but we made it work and I'm so happy we did. It's not like life is perfect but it's a thousand times better than where we were back then. You know, I feel like sometimes my daughter takes for granted seeing these new places, going to these new places, but I know looking back, she'll be happy because my family traveled on the railroad when I was younger. I didn't think much of it back at the time, but looking back for so long, I, uh, it was the best days of my life. That's why we made the decision just to get off that hamster wheel, you know, of just go to work so you can survive it's modern day slavery is what it is i mean it is what it is but anyways so yeah no regrets
All right, another question that's popular because everybody loves buying Amazon. I mean, that's where we get most of our crap these days is how do we handle our mail situation? So we usually stay places three, six, nine months at a time. So we're not quite as transient as some of you. When we roll into town, first thing we do is go down to the post office, get a P.O. box. It's really simple usually. It's probably about 60 bucks for six months, I think is about what we've been spending. And no issues, get yourself a P.O. box opened up, get your mail forwarded from the last P.O. box. And uh, that's about all you have to do. They don't give you no crap. Usually it's really easy just to get one. They might want to see like a receipt from the campground or something. I don't know, usually Jen takes care of that, but it's never been an issue. So mail, not that tough. If you're staying stationary for a few months at a time at least. If you are bouncing around more, you can do general delivery at a lot of post offices. Call ahead and find out and you can have your stuff delivered to the next town you're gonna be in. Like if you are, if something's gonna be like a week's delivery, you know you're gonna be in Denver in a week. Find a post office that'll let you do general delivery there so you can pick it up. And then there is UPS drop spots and FedEx drop spots. They'll be at like discount auto parts and weird little, uh, weird little uh, companies, stores that you can get your stuff delivered to. So look it up on their website. And like I said, if you know you're gonna be in a week ahead of time, you can have it delivered to those kind of spots. But you gotta be quick, gotta pick your stuff up quick. If it's there more in a few days, they'll send it back. Another question that comes up is, uh, do we have problems finding big rig friendly campgrounds? The key word there is campgrounds. A campground's gonna be a little bit more primitive, typically, not all the time. So I usually, first thing I look for is RV parks. That tells you they're gonna be typically, not all the time, typically more big rig friendly. I also use Google Maps. So I zoom in and look ahead and take a look at the campground, the turns inside it, what it looks like. They'll say on their website whether they're big rig friendly. I'll tell you there's some that say it and you get there and you're like, are you kidding me? Um, definitely. Google map it, look at the campground ahead of time also, even if they say it. But RV parks is what you want to typically look for. We did a campground the first night we ever had our RV and it was on top. It, it was a catastrophe. Someday I'll have to go into it. But the only time I ever hurt my RV, I slid off a, a road slash trail into a tree. Ugh. Campo sent me up there. It wasn't my fault. I knew no better. I was ignorant. Anyways, so if you do have a big rig, look for RV parks. I, I don't think we've ever had an issue though. And we have a 40 footer finding a place to park it. You'd think you call up, say, oh, I got a 40 footer and they go, oh my God, no, we don't have room for that. But most actually do have room for that. A lot of people have 40 footers. You won't have an issue with that. You do some of the things when you call campgrounds though, make sure if you got an animal, it's animal friendly. That, and then uh, if you have an extra car, like we have my truck, the uh, fifth wheel, and then Jen drives the Subaru. So you just wanna mention you have that extra car usually. Sometimes they charge you an extra five bucks a night because they're dicks, but a lot of time it's fine. You just kind of snug it in your sight for the night. That's my tips on finding an RV friendly campground is find an RV park. How much does it cost to live full-time in an RV? Well, that's a loaded question. For us, typically an RV park doing monthlies, it's 400 to 700 a month, including utilities. Even if sometimes it's billed separately, it never usually totals much more than that. If you're staying places daily, it's a lot more expensive. But four to $700, that's not a bulk of what we spend our money on like you. Everyone else, probably the bulk of it's Amazon still somehow, don't understand it. Amazon, entertainment going out places, gas, food is, food's the biggest. Food's probably 1500 bucks a month. I don't even know how, I don't even know how we do it. I keep trying to cut back. We're not gonna live like we're broke if we're, if we're not, you know, like anyone else. RV life, it can be as cheap as you wanna make it and it can be as expensive as you wanna make it. But when it comes to at least the housing end of it, much more affordable than living in an actual house, from my experience, from what we've been doing. Now bulk of our money goes to groceries, goes to Amazon purchases, goes to entertainment, going out places. It's freed up a lot of money for that kind of stuff over just paying your bills to survive. It is what you make it. Another popular question is what's the best RV to full time in? My personal preference is for a fifth wheel for many reasons. Popular RVs people use though are pull behind trailers, class A's, class C's, pretty much everything. Tent campers, maybe, I don't know, probably. 
But anyways, my personal preference is a fifth wheel. I'll tell you why. If you're living in a class A, something mechanical breaks on that engine, it's gotta go to a dealer. It's gotta go to someone specializes in class A. Most time class A's, they're like diesel engines in them, which is already a pain in the butt to find a mechanic to work on. But the suspension and all that specialty stuff, usually it's not part of a normal truck. It's hard to find people to work on those. And it's your house that someone's gonna have to work on. You know, if you got a fifth wheel, for instance, you got a normal Chevy Ford Dodge, whatever truck, any local mechanic's gonna be able to work on that. And you're gonna be able to dump your RV off at the park. So you're not gonna have to live in a mechanic's parking lot for weeks or a month. You know, parts are on shortage and you don't want a specialty vehicle. A lot of those class A's, everything in them, nothing is generic, everything's specific to that brand. So I, I love class A's, they're pretty cool, but you know, unless I had a lot of money, I wouldn't really mess with them. Then my other reason for a fifth wheel is when you're towing. A fifth wheel tows straight down the road in heavier winds a lot better than a bumper pull. Bumper pull gets swaying a lot easier. These fifth wheels do better on the highway. Um, and another reason, you're already living in a small space. Go down to a dealer and look at the difference in height inside a travel trailer and a fifth wheel. When I was in a lot of those travel trailers, the roof wasn't much higher than my head, maybe an inch or two. But in this big beast, I can't even touch the roof inside. So it makes the space feel so much bigger. Usually you have bigger pullouts. You do need a bigger truck though, so there, there is that. And I'll finish it up with one more reason I like trailers, fifth wheels in general, over say a class C motorhome or a class A motorhome is when you get somewhere, you can disconnect. You can take your truck, you can go drive around, do stuff. You know, if you have a class A or class C, you're gonna wanna pull a car behind you, a toad. You're gonna wanna pull something back behind you still anyways. So, I mean, you're still towing something. One more final, we have owned a class A Bounder before. I love that big beast. But it was like driving a bus down the road. It literally was a bus. But when you get somewhere, you're exhausted, you're tired, you're still in the same environment that you were driving in the whole time. You know, you get a total change in environment when you get out of that truck and you get to go back into your house. I prefer the fifth wheel. What are the biggest challenges to RV life? So for me, my position in particular, it's the relocating. Bringing your RV into areas you haven't been before, you don't know where the roads are gonna be. You try to do your best with Google Maps and looking ahead, but it's the navigating, getting there. You don't wanna get down a road you can't get back from. You don't wanna get an RV park that you're gonna slide off a trail and hit a tree. Been there, done that. You know, that's the stressful part. Are we gonna get there in one piece without any breaks, without any incidences? I'd say half the time, I've always had stupid incidences. Just, they find me. Probably my biggest stresses of RV life is just getting the RV to different locations in one piece and have everything go smoothly. Usually it does, but it's still stressful, you know? Maybe if I had a smaller RV, you know, having a 40 footer don't make things much easier. It's freaking being an 18 wheel trucker driving that thing down the road. If you're asking me from my point of view, once I get somewhere, I'm happy. It's just getting there. That can be a drama sometimes, you know, especially when you got dogs and they want to go out and go pee and you got a wife that wants to stop and go pee every freaking hour, having to pull off on little off ramps and she can run back up in here and it's getting there. That's why I think eventually I'd like to experiment and get a truck camper. It'd be pretty sweet. Just pull in places, just drive like a normal truck, you know, it'd be pretty awesome. Yeah, that's my opinion. Ow, motherfucker. Ah, oh, dang it. All right, important question. RV maintenance, how do I handle it? Well, I'll tell you, it helps to be a DIY kind of person. These things aren't super complicated. If you're used to working on stuff at your house, it's pretty easy to convert over to this. It's a little different, but it's pretty easy. There's a million different resources from Facebook groups, online forums to YouTube. Almost anything still can be found on YouTube. Any problem you've had, somebody else has probably had it before you, even on your specific brand. Come into my comment section if you have issues. I'll help you, I'll do the best I can. But you know, it does help to be able to do your own repairs because not gonna lie, if, if you're the kind of person that's not very handy and needs to have repairs done by a professional, that can be a drama sometimes. A lot of these places are just packed. You know, a lot of the camping worlds, a lot of these RV shops that do the repairs, they're backlogged. They have so many that need repairs, or it could be the parts taking forever to get here from overseas. It's best if you can do these repairs yourself. And a lot of them are super simple. You don't need to be a rocket scientist. You can find the answers out there. One of the sayings that I've always gone by is if there's a will, there's a way. Even the most complicated situations, there's usually a way to fix it and you can do it. That's my best advice when it comes to repairs is don't be afraid to do your own research and try to make the repair yourself. It's not rocket science. 
pets. Pets in RV life. Can it be done? Yes. Unless you have nine pit bulls. I know I've said it in other videos. I, I'll never forget this Facebook post I read. This lady said she was doing RV life. I said, do you think it'll be an issue? I have nine pit bulls. I think it might be. I love pit bulls. Don't get me wrong. Nine's a little excessive. Nine of anything. If you had nine chihuahuas, it'd be an issue. So anyways, yeah, pet and RV life. It's not crazy. It's not that big a deal. A lot of these RV parks, some, a lot of them have um, pet parks inside them, dog parks. Take your dogs over there and whatnot. It's easiest from my experience if you have two dogs or less. Um, if you're staying somewhere overnight, you got more than that, just tell them you got two dogs. Take your dogs out one at a time. Ain't no one watching. I mean, that that's my opinion. That's what I do. We don't have issues. The only issues we ever have with having pets is A, some RV parks, we had three dogs. Now we're unfortunately down to two. Some RV parks had a two dog limit. And B, you know, you just gotta make sure you pick up after your dog, which reminds me I need to do that over here. But, um, and in the winter, it can be rough if it's super cold out, you know, to take them out to go potty. Be mindful, that can be an issue too. You're gonna be out there in those temperatures, walking them around while they sit there and sniff around for 20 minutes trying to find a place to pee. So that's an issue, but I mean, that's not much different than if you had a house. So I don't think living RV life makes owning a couple dogs much more complicated and if you have cats we got a cat cats are fine they don't care just don't let it outside you don't want to go looking for it in your town that's your biggest fear is them getting loose on you when you're staying somewhere new dogs not as bad cats cats are creepers man they get loose they just hide from you You'd be screaming their name and they just let you walk right past them most of the time when you think your cat got out it's hiding somewhere in the rv trust me personal experience won't forget that where are we at? Great Falls, Montana. Jeez, Luna. Boy, she almost screwed us over. <clears throat> she was hiding in like the slide. It wasn't until we put the slide in and had already said our goodbyes to Luna, which is hard because we loved her, had her for like eight years. And then all of a sudden she came running out. She's back behind the bed. And when the slide started moving, she came running out. She just didn't want to go back in the cat care. So I don't even know where I'm going with this. Anyways, animals, they don't complicate RV life much at all. If you're used to having animals, it's the same story. Smaller house is all. You're fine. All right, and there's some of you that are very environmentally conscious people, and you're wondering how sustainable to the environment is RV living? My answer is very. But the biggest difference when you're living in the RV is you use a lot less water. You're more conscious of what you're using water-wise, electricity-wise. Um, like we use a compost toilet, so that saves, I don't know, 100,000 gallons a year or something over what you'd use flush in your house. We don't use no water to have to go potty. Still shower and whatnot, but even when it comes to showering, you're usually more limited on how much water's in your water heater. You know, it's it's a smaller amount. You're going to use a lot less when you live in an RV of everything. It makes you much more conscious of how much garbage you're going through, how much electricity you're using. I think if everybody lived in RVs, it'd be a lot more environmentally friendly. You know, and besides that, a lot of RVers choose more eco-friendly ways of doing their utilities. Solar panels, it's huge in the RV world. Even though they got to drive places to get there, a lot of people are running on solar. They're saving the environment. A lot quicker than most of you hippies living in your house pretending to save the environment flushing your toilet gallon and a half two gallons every flush you know cranking on your electricity just running washer and dryers and big screen tvs and all that while you sit there and watch greta van thornton whatever her freaking name is on tv crying that you're saving the environment when you're not so anyways not to piss anyone off Another big one I see all the time on the internet is people talking about how you can't have an RV over 10 years of age or else no RV parks are going to let you in. It's not true. Let me tell you something. We've been going for about a year and a half now and I've never seen an RV park kick people out because of the age of the RV. I have been to RV parks that had the rule and they just didn't enforce it. I believe they kept that rule to enforce it against certain types of people that they didn't want in their park. And I can honestly say not a racist thing because I've seen races of every kind inside these parks. I feel like some have used it maybe to keep families out with little kids because they have a majority of older folks in there and don't want kids running around screaming. I, I really think it's more about your socioeconomical background, whatever you want to say, how much money you got, you know, you got a nice looking rig. Because I've seen them have that rule and then they let these old vintage RVs in that are probably from the 60s and whatnot, but look like they cost $100,000. You know, they let those guys in, but then I've seen them not let other people in because they just, they looked a little more hippie. And when I say I've seen them, this is more of like online what I've absorbed, absorbed people 
complaining about on Facebook groups. Cause me personally, a lot of the RV parks I've been to, I've seen online, they did say they had a 10 year or older rule, but none of them enforced. Maybe it was popular during COVID when they had, they could cherry pick what campers they let in their parks. Nowadays, things are slowing down a little bit more and they want your money. Don't fall for that. You need a brand new rig. In my opinion, I haven't seen it yet. Now we are mostly in the Northwest area, anywhere from Northern California up to Montana and in Idaho and stuff like that. But never ran into anyone caring how old our RV was. I do understand why they have this rule because I have been to a park before and I swear to God, I think we had felons at the park. Cops were through weekly. Hey, did you see this guy? Did you see that guy? Do you know Tom? No, I don't know anyone. I keep to myself, you know? There's a difference between people at camp for recreation. There's a difference between people at camp because they love the lifestyle. And then there's those people that are forced in to RVs because they can't afford housing. And I don't got nothing against those people, you know? I've been there, I've done that, I understand. Um, but it does change the vibe in a park. You know, one outside playing cornhole or pickleball or whatever, you know, they're, they're miserable, they're sad, they're pissed off and I get it. There is a reason for that. I don't know what the answer is. I believe this lifestyle should be accessible to everyone. You know, there's good people that don't have a lot of money that might buy an older RV just to take their family out. They should be able to go to those nice parks too. But I get it, you don't want it to turn out like a homeless encampment. So I do understand that we, you don't want it looking like Seattle or California with 20 broke down RVs in it and drug addicts sitting out there shooting up. I get it. So I don't know what the answer is, but I can say I haven't ran into a park that actually enforced that rule. I mean, my RV is pretty decent looking. It's, it, I mean, it's not beauty clean. It's not bad though. So I don't know. Maybe I've been treated differently than some others, but I have heard online some were treated unfairly. And I hate that. Some people, beautiful RVs, they have kids and RV owners didn't want kids in their RV park. Bull crap. Don't fall for that 10 year rule. Unless you're heading south, I'm pretty sure to Arizona. It's a park you probably don't want to be in to begin with. I don't think you're gonna have Some it. of that was helpful to some of you considering the RV life. Like I said, not the authority, giving you my opinion, my experience from last year and a half on the road and what I've learned. So if any of this is helpful, as always, I would appreciate a like be cool if you subscribe, you know, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.